I'll start with a project of mine. I'm running this project for uh, five years, five years and a half. Uh, I'm maintaining the project from day one. I had two big releases. It's going to be well. I'm pretty happy with the result. And these are uh, these are my two kids. <laughs> so my daughter is five years old. My son is just eight months old. And if you have a baby, you probably know that uh, in the beginning when the baby is just a few months old, the only one which is able to get the baby to sleep is mom, right? Well, at home, at home, I was the cure for a couple of months. I had my, uh, my workflow, I had my, my buttons, yes. At my partners, I told my son in a specific way. I was going from room to room. I was even singing. So everything no, it's fine. So everything was going was, was going pretty well. I was able to do it. Then suddenly my son one day said, Wait a minute, Dad, you don't have books. You can't breastfeed me. So Fuck off. I'll just scream and cry and I'll never fall asleep with him. So I failed. And the things which I was applying the day before, they stopped working. Then I realized that uh, in almost every job, one of the pretty good things is that you want something. You, uh, you have this knowledge and then on the day after, you acquire this knowledge and you see it working. That's why today I decided to talk about React JS and patterns. Because if you get something from a, some language or technology, just make sure that these are uh, patterns. Don't try to remember the API or uh, the documentation or any comments or stuff. You better get concepts. That's why I think in, yeah, that's why I think in React is, is important to learn patterns. Uh, to make sure that we're on the same page, I'll say a few things about React. React is not... Uh, just before that, how many of you use React? Okay. And how many of you know about React but they don't use it? Okay, yeah, that's good. So, uh, React is not a framework, it's a library. It's a view layer. It's something that renders a template to a DOM element. Every React app is a bunch of components, which are just templates and some logic. And this logic is not really connected to React. It could be just completely outside of React ecosystem. Which means that you could switch React to something else and you see people using uh, uh, Angular with concepts which uh, initially started in the React ecosystem. And the thing which React became famous with uh, the JSX just, just syntax, which is uh, kind of breaking the separation of concerns where we have HTML and JavaScript. Uh, but now we see that lots of people are adopting the idea and there are lots of other libraries and frameworks which I actually use in this approach. So, I'll start with a couple of simple patterns. But there, this doesn't mean that they're not important. The first one is composition. And to illustrate my example, I'll use this website for the fucking well done. And it's, if you go there, you type your city to see a nice message about the web. So let's see if we want to do this with React. Uh, we have this app component, and we have a page inside, and we have the results and search. So how to build this with React? Let's say that we have uh, this main component, we are importing the page, we are rendering the page, and the page contains the results in the search, right? And this is working, but it's not very flexible. 
because one thing to say, we need the page without the search, for example, or without the results, for example. Then the brute force approach to solve this issue is to create another page file that contains only the, um, the search, for example. That's why the React team came with this nice API. Uh, with this nice API, uh, a couple of props children. In every React component, the props are the input of the component. There are some way to send something to the component uh, configuration, and they represent the, the tags that we put inside our component. So in this case, the page component still represents this section tag, which is the main job of the page component. Right? And we are completely, uh, we don't care what's inside. That's why we, uh, this props children is very nice, because it, we are able to render something in this component, but we have no idea what the exactly it is. And here, our, uh, here is how our app component looks like. We have, uh, again, our page, but we just place the other two components inside. But this is the simplest approach for composition in React, using props children inside the page component. Uh, and props children is actually equal to results and search. And the funny thing is that a props children could be anything. Could be, like in this case, for example, it's a function. This uh, function with a far end. So it could be a string, could be a number. And in, in this example, we are uh, implementing some kind of communication between the parent and the child, which is pretty archaic in React. But um, we are able to say from outside of the component, not to be the component inside, but still give opportunity to a base component to say, uh, to propagate some information. To the part. And based on this information, the part, uh, which is what we right now, we render either the results or the search. So, uh, the better composition in React leads to simple components. Because using props children, we are just doing uh, only one thing in our components. We don't care about what's inside. We, we're just doing one thing by rendering the section that's and because these components are so simple, it's really easy to test. React is maybe the first framework with the first library which I'm using, and the testing is so, so easy. And that's because we have like these components uh, everywhere, and it's really easy to get something in isolation and just test on them. And because they're easy to test, they're simple, they're quite flexible because you could render lots of stuff inside. What about uh, these components? What kind of components do we have? So this consists about presentational and container components. Some people call them dump and smart components. There's some other naming uh, that I like this one. So what exactly is, is this? Let's look at this website. It's called I can't help. It's just an animation. This sheet by jumping and you count and you're supposed to sleep. Uh, the boss did. So let's say that we have all this stuff into SVG files. And we want to, uh, to make this animation. So that's a component which has just two methods. The first one runs when we render the component into the DOM. And there's some logic which is uh, calculating the new position of the sheet. And we just update the state. So this one is updating the state of the component. Uh, we pass the new position of the sheet, and inside the render method, we just render everything. So in general, this company is doing two things. One is calculating the position of the sheet, and the other one is rendering the component. So what if we extract the content of the render method and put it into another component called scene? Uh, this component becomes a container component because it calls only the logic that we need, like the whole population and stuff. And the data that we have to apply to the sheet and to the other like, elements of the page, we just pass it into another component. The other component is called presentational component because it's only about how things look like. 
it, it doesn't contain any water. And uh, from React, I think 15, or, or, I, I'm not sure. Uh, they support components just as functions. So in this example, we just have JSA syntax. We don't need to extend React or something. And in the apps which I'm working on, all the presentation components, they're such stateless functions. I'm saying stateless because they, they don't uh, care about the data. They just accept a few props, and they just render them. Uh, this is a huge win for UI development. Because if you split your components into, into container and presentation components, you are able to have this uh, bucket with, com with uh, components and scripts which are just about the watch build up. And you have this UI layer which is about how things look like. And we are not even testing this code because it's not doing anything, it's just rendering. If you're going to test this, it, I, I think it's pointed because uh, we guess that uh, React team already tested how React renders stuff. So you don't have to do this. Um, so try splitting, if you're building React up, try splitting your components into container components that know about the data, they know where the data comes from, they operate with data, they, they modify or transform the data, uh, and they are concerned with the with how that, book, uh, how that works, they contain business logic, while the presentation components, they're just about how things look like. Another pattern, which I believe is, uh, is maybe the most important of this section about the back of the components. Everything in React, uh, well, not everything, but most of the stuff in, in React ecosystem, is actually built on top of hardware components. So this pattern is uh, almost everywhere. If you're using some open source library which is React related, uh, I'm pretty sure that there's some hardware component components. Inside. The name of this type of components comes from hardware function, which in JavaScript is a uh, function that may accept the function and return the function, function as a result. In React system, uh, the hardware component is usually a function, a factory function. I kind of reinvented the factory functions in, in React. Uh, it's a factory function that accepts our component and returns another component. And the main characteristic of this other new component, the called hardware component, is to render the original one, the one that you sent to the function. In this example, it seems a little pointed because uh, all it does is just rendering the same component. It's, it's not doing anything else. But there are a couple of interesting points. So we see that we propagate the props past the hardware component. This is really important and it, it's something which I uh, found as an issue many times. Because uh, usually the hardware component is exported from the file where the, the original component is, is the same. And the developers from the outside, they have no idea that there is a hardware component. They just want to like, use this component, but they don't know that inside you define your component and you export uh, this hardware component, which is wrapping the original one. So the usage of this spread is, is really nice here because you just say, okay, everything that you pass to the hardware component, just pass it down to the original one. And the other interesting bit is the state. So in this example, we'll see this in a bit. Uh, in this example, we don't have any logic, but usually hard points, they, uh, they do something, and if they have state, they give it uh, here, and at, at this level, and we just pass the state to our original component. And it comes as a props, so we're not aware of what's going on here. So let's take uh, another simple example. So this is a usage of hardware component. We have a simple function which just renders a paragraph, a status component. We pass it to uh, our factory function and we get enhanced version of our original component. And we continue working with the enhanced version. So these two lines are usually one file. So you, you don't know that this is happening. 
And if, if you get something from NPA, for example, which is reactivated, you're probably working with uh, target component. Because if you're something that enhances your component, you pass it to the library and it's, it, it's wrapped into, into a target component. Let's take some real uh, example. Let's say that we have a list component. It's just a table, which is sortable, so it's pretty uh, usable thing in, in most apps. If you have a dashboard, you have this table where you want to measure some data, and the columns are sortable. So this is done into the nesting point. This component accepts uh, all the uh, data as items group. And now we want to populate this uh, component with, with some data. So we have this with data uh, higher component. It actually is a factory function that returns a higher component. And we pass our list component, and we get another uh, another one which we work with. So for the developer of the list component, uh, it's his job or her job is to develop the this table with certain book columns. Uh, the developer is not aware of where the data comes from. This component could be easily tested and like uh, yeah distributed to the whole app. And for the developer which is dealing with the data, the only job that he has to do is inside the data. Here's how the data looks like. It's still a function that accepts our original component, in our case this that is. And Inside the constructor, we are saying, okay, the items right now are just known. So this is also important because here is a place where we could say this is empty array, for example, or create some initial state of, uh, of this whole thing. And we are able to, in, uh, in the list point, we are able to say, okay, there is no data or there are zero items in this array, so I'll just show a warning message. And then when this company is mount, we use this get items function, which is like coming from somewhere. Uh, it's getting the data, and we update the state of the, of the component, of the power component. And here's how you render uh, uh, components when you get something, or something changed. We use the set state method. And in this case, because we're updating, updating the state of the component, then we render the original component. And because we're passing uh, the state uh, using the spread operator, the items which are now containing a whole information, they, they reach the list component. So you can see that just by wrapping everything into this small function, we are able to create a layer in the middle between the, the visual representation of the data and the actual business logic. So this is really important when you are developing pickups because. Uh, Easily we could say, okay, we'll just get this get items function and we'll press it into the list component. And then we can use it there and we just render everything. Yeah, that's right, but then if you need the sortable table in some other place of your app, you can't use the list component. You have to create another one or extend it. So the higher components are essential tool in the app ecosystem. They could be a wrapper, could be a proxy, could be a decorator. Uh, some people use it for Dependence injection. I think it's just a Swiss knife. You could use it for everything. If you have a basic component and you want to extend it, that's the way to go. Just wrap everything into a higher component because it's, it's even easier to test because uh, that's a function that accepts a component. And in, in, in your test, you can send something completely different. It could be not the actual list component, it could be something very really simple. Uh, you could mock most of the stuff. Uh, another pattern which is a bit higher, it's about how we uh, organize the data pool. When I started using React, everything was really easy, and I, I guess the same for you. You start using the library, you see how you can render markup, you see how to update the market and uh, like, uh, send some data or something. But when you start building real apps, you realize that React is actually a view layer. You don't have these uh, directions that, uh, for example, Angular or Ember comes with. You have no idea how to wire this company, so where you keep your data and stuff. The one direction data flow was actually the beginning of, uh, of my journey into, uh, into React. That was the first thing which I 
really wide from there. And I say, oh, that's, that really makes sense. So let's get another website called tribepub.com. It's about input fields. You type your password, and the website answers with a password based message about how weak your password is. So it really helps about generating nice passwords. But it, it, it's never effective to kind of type. If you type just keys, it's, it's still getting password based message. So let's get this input field. Um, Coming from other uh, two-way data binding frameworks, like Envoy, for example, I was using, uh, I started with this code, where I had just an input field, and inside the value attribute, I say, it's those data there. So I expect that when I start typing into an input field, I'll get, uh, I'll get the, the value of the input field inside the table of the function. Well, the thing is that it's, it's not working. I, I started typing, and I don't even see what I'm typing. And I was thinking, this might be with a priest or something, but I see the cursor blinking, but I type something, and nothing happens. This must be wrong, I was thinking. Then I started reading about, uh, in React, there's these concepts about controlled and uncontrolled input. In this case, this is controlled input. Because what I'm saying here is that React, Render this input field, and the value of this input field is the value of the state of there. And I'm actually not changing the state at all. So React is rendering properly, right? It's I'm not a the state, even, even, even though I'm typing something, and it is fine that I'm not seeing anything because I'm not updating the state. So I have to like write this code where I create a handler of the input field, I get the value of the input field inside this handler, and then I update the state, which triggers the rendering of the component, and then I see what I'm typing. I was looking at this like 30 lines of code, and I was thinking, gosh, just for like handling input field, I have to write these handlers everywhere, and even I have to use this bind, because if I don't use this bind, I don't get this here or there above. So we, we usually get this function, we define it in the, in the constructor. So it's, it's really lots of code just for like handling input fields. <coughs> then I continue reading, and I realize that this is actually brilliant. It's a it's really nice way of developing to write, because the data falls in only one direction. We get this uh, user, which is typing in the input field. We get, we get an event, uh, we handle the uh, the interaction, we get the value we put into the state, and we uh, send the value in the state to the right, the component. So, this is one direction that we call. This is how React works. This is something very, really, really simple, but it's really powerful. And that's because you have only one place where the data comes from, and only one place where you, you actually keep the data. I think you'll agree with me that the biggest issue of developing UI is the fact that we have so many states, so many places where we keep data, and it's really difficult to manage these places. For example, here we can say, okay, we're developing a profile page, we have input fields with, with the email of the user, and we want to update this, uh, this email. When you save the email, uh, in the next rendering of the page, you create the API, you get the email, and now here's the question, where will you uh, store the data, this email? So we keep it in the state of the conference, for example. There's only one place that needs the data. You don't have to sync and put fields using another like, wall. If you update the field, you don't have to like, sync the state, the internal state of some, some bit of the app and then update the data storage. That's because the data is actually in one, one single place. And of course, uh, following these ideas, you end up with the conclusion that you can't keep everything into the state of the components. The, one of the best practices in React right now is to not use state at all in your components. If you have an app which is just presentational components with just uh, state, for example, or with status functions, which just render market, this is quite perfect. 
So the people came with some other buttons, which I'll go in a bit. But they say, okay, we'll keep the data in the store. So we keep the state. And then our component becomes something like this. We just have one render function and we have one handler. And the input field is just accepting the props, the, the, the getting the value uh, from, from the props of the component. And here we say, okay, uh, the, the value of the input field is changed, just inform the other part of the system. I don't care if you if you're storing this uh, this data somewhere. That's only one job of this company. It's just about rendering the value and saying that the value is changed and sending out the value. Where this data goes after this? Is it like stored somewhere and then we trigger rendering? We have no idea. But developing UI using these ideas is so much easier because this is declarative programming. You just say uh, what you want to see at the end. You're not doing it. You just define all the stuff without thinking about what's happening with this data and the event and stuff. So in React apps, the data flows in only one direction. If you remember, I showed you an example with the uh, when I was talking about composition, how we send a function to the child and we call this function and we get another component as a result and we render this component. So this is wrong. You shouldn't be sending data to the parent this communication sh shouldn't happen at all. It's always from parent to child, and at some point in the child, you say to the system in some other way that something changed, and then the data always comes from uh, from the top. Which leads to the next uh, biggest pattern, uh, the false pattern. So at one of their conferences, Facebook introduced this concept. Uh, with a really nice example, they show us how they uh, refactor their notification system, and it really makes sense, right? This was a really nice idea, so what exactly is it? So we still have these views, which are our components, uh, and something happened there, like we type something in input, for example. Then we dispatch, uh, something called action, which in other contexts is called event. So it's just a object with a type, like for example, password change, and some metadata, which in our case could be a data And this action goes to a single place called dispatcher, which is like a central hub of all the actions, all the events in the system. Dispatcher receives all the actions and sends all the actions to something called stores. So the stores are about keeping the data. They know about how the data looks like, uh, there are some modifications or filtering that should happen in the store. And then the stores the data view. So in our case, with the password field, for example, here we say, uh, okay, the, the, someone types something in the data field. With dispatch action, it goes to the dispatcher, we have a password store, for example. Uh, the store receives this section, and because it's interested about this section, I forgot to mention that all the stores, they receive all the actions in the system. But they react only on the actions that they are interested in. And because we have a password store, which is interested about this section, we update the internal structure and we say, okay, update the bit. You see the one direction data form? It's again happening here. And the nice thing about this pattern is as well that we could actually uh, dispatch actions not only from uh, from views, for example, but from other parts of the systems. This is one of the uh, probably common approach to bootstrap your React app. You just say boot, for example. Or if you need some data up front, we render some preloading string, for example, and you fetch the data, and then you define uh, action when you're done with the dispatch and you go to the form. Uh, so, yeah. Here's an example of how we could implement Flux. Flux is uh, probably the, like every React developer, when started using React, it comes with 
is someone on their own version of Prox. It's like if, if you search for Prox implementation, there are so many. And I, I try to it in, into three slides. So this could be a dispatcher. We have this array of stores where we keep the stores, we have a register method where we, we put something into this array, and we have dispatch methods where we just loop to the stores and we say, here is the attention. The store uh, usually contains this big, big switch statement, uh, which is checking the tackle action, and it reacts on this, uh, this action. And uh, yeah, in this example, it's a factory function that could be just a class, for example, and we send the dispatcher. And in, in the last line, we register the, uh, this simple object in the dispatcher. And here's where the hard component comes into the game. We need this wire function because we need to say somehow in the Fox pattern, if you, uh, so if you check most, most of the Fox patterns, the implementation of Fox architecture, you see that there is nothing related to React except this function. Because Fox, people use Fox with Angular, for example. It's completely agnostic. It's not only about React. It's not only about Facebook. And it's working really well because it's implemented this one direction data pool. And we have a single store data, we have these actions. Uh, so usually, even in Redux, for example, which I will mention in the next slide, uh, in Redux, there's a connect function, which is exactly this. It's, you pass the store, you pass the component, and this function connects uh, this two thing. So here, for example, we just uh, say, when we update the store, we update the state of this component. And always when we update the state of the component, we trigger the rendering. Uh, so in this case, we're just writing uh, some component for store changes. And of course, it's not, uh, it's not a library. It's just a single pattern, some ideas. Even Facebook, they uh, open source their post implementation in the beginning was just a dispatcher. So you look the talk at their conference, you say, oh yeah, I want to use this. You open the repo and you see just a dispatcher. You have no idea how to implement the stores and stuff. Uh, that's why people started creating this out uh, and like there are thousands of questions. Uh, but now this has changed. Facebook has uh, their implementation of books, like we have a factory of functions for creating store, for wiring, for uh, asynchronous uh, events and stuff. So if you open this right now, it's use their implementation. Uh, the hype right now is Redux. So they, most people when they say React, oh, I'm Redux, yeah, I'm Redux. Um, to be honest, I'm using React for two years and a half, probably. Uh, we're still not using Redux. We have our own implementation of Fox. Uh, and that's because, probably, because we have some legacy and it's kind of time consuming to move to Redux. But it's actually working pretty well for us. The difference between Redux and Fox, but some people say that Redux is not following the Fox pattern. I still think, that, still think that this is. Uh, yeah, not the same, but it's pretty close. Uh, the thing is that in Redux, we don't have many stores, we have just one store. And we have this reducer functions, which that's, that's actually the, I think, the best feature of Redux, and that's why people really like it, because of the reducers. It's really easy to think about them. There's, these are just simple JavaScript functions. You receive the previous version of the state and some action. So you have the whole data in, in your app, and you receive some action that happened in the system, and you have to return another version of the data. It's a pure function, everything is immutable, it's really easy to test, so like everything is done using the users, it's, it's very nice. And then we have this uh, uh, action creators, which are kind of like a dispatcher, but still one direction data for, we still have actions, and still have state, and still we have this kind of component, which receives, uh, the updates from the store and see the variables. Uh, I guess if you want to use React, 
I would suggest first to start with Fox, with One Direction Data Flow, to understand why the people implement in that way. And then continue with Redux and the whole like a chain of libraries for Redux, which are uh, so this is my last slide. There is this very cool in GitHub. I tried to connecting such patterns, so you can use them. Go there first, click this button here. So you can't delete anything before hitting the button. It's starting. You should click it before you can. And there are lots of other, but there are lots was part of some patterns which I didn't talk about. Uh, the dependency injection is really important in, in, in React. It's, uh, it's not always trivial to send some, because you have this big tree of components where they are nested into each other, and if you have something, some information that needs to go to a pretty lower part of your system, but you have it at the top, it's, sometimes it's, it's difficult to understand how to send it there. Uh, so yeah, I, I didn't mention the dependency suggestion, but it's, it's there. So yeah, that's for me. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have about seven minutes for questions. Okay, you. I'll, I'll go first. So you show so much JavaScript that my head hurts. But, uh, do you have any uh, measurable data uh, if you use these patterns inside of your projects and how, how much they improve? Do we have that kind of data? So, uh, some things like the composition, for example, in the beginning, uh, this thing with one creation data pool, they're, I think they're pretty simple and they don't really change. It's, it's, uh, I, I could split my work with React into two phases. The first one was where I had no idea what I'm doing, and the other one is where I actually kind of think where I understand the stuff. But the wiring function, for example, we changed it so many times. So definitely there are some patterns which improve over time. Um, but when I look back and when I'm seeing our apps right now, we're literally just writing components and some like actions and stores, we are not changing the infrastructure, which is I mean, really nice. This is uh, something which I would not mention. Uh, React right now is used by lots of companies. Some of them are really big. And that's because, it's not because it's made by Facebook, it's in the simple stuff, but it's because there's a uh, library and the uh, quotes and credits. This thing just scales very really well with big things. It's just really easy to get into it, and it's really easy to maintain everything, because everything is really simple and split in components. If you have some uh, business or you're wondering about the framework, React is the way to go. React is the way to go, then. <laughs> uh, so who's next? I think Buark has a question. Uh, I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It was too much JavaScript? Or was it scary? <laughs> yeah, there is a question here. Hey, my question is about how are the components or functions? Uh, coming from libraries which uh, use inheritance to get one component to reuse a font from another. If I need to extend the library, then I can easily pick a component which is closest to what I need, like an input build. I can uh, inherit from that to get all the functionality that is there and uh, add my small changes and then I ship my new component and it will fit in the library just fine. How do we do that with uh, our components? Because when you create a hardware component, what the library sees is the new component and not the old one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mean that this big thing that you want to extend is uh, a, again React component or is something completely different? Like a jQuery component, for example? Doesn't matter. 
Okay, it's so just it's just something small that I want to ask to Mrs. Okay, so um, I think there are two answers to this question. The first one is um, if we have another React component, it's much easier because it's using the same APIs. So it's it's much easier to extend it because we have this clear input and you know that this company has like if, a, if you have a really nice autocomplete, for example, you know that this company has a function about getting the suggestions in the autocomplete, like uh, the current value or something. So you have really clear input. It's really easy to extend it. Another story is if you have uh, something which is not React related, then you have to apply a couple of tricks that's mainly because of the, uh, of the rendering of that. Because React, uh, you should, what you should keep is the way of how React renders that. You shouldn't be messing the rendering process. You shouldn't be uh, accessing Tom elements and just, just change them. So if you want to extend something which is doing this, you should instruct React inside the power component. You should say, never render what's inside me. That's how you, you bring the part wires into React. And uh, again, I think it's again pretty easy because in React it's really clear, you know, the input is, is really clear. Uh, in your power component, you've already set what your library needs and some other additional stuff. But the, yeah, the key point is just to handle the rendering. That's the most challenging thing when you're bringing, uh, when you're bringing third party libraries into React. Uh, yeah, right, uh, when I'm trying to miss I mean, a, a library which works quite differently. Uh, my question was, was more about how do you, if, if for example it's an autocomplete and I want to change the the formatting of the, the items which are displayed in the list, that, that's all I want. I will do it in a React, okay? And I think will be React good. And just I want my component to be accepted by the library. Just if it was yeah, not a field. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess you could do it. Because uh, React, even though it's uh, it's handling the rendering, they have like a leaf, a uh, small door, where they have API for accessing the actual DOM elements. So if you want to change the how the things looks like, there's two ways to do it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'm answering the right question, but yeah, you can check it.